What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak, and happy 4th of July, first of all, to everyone. I hope that y'all have the day off and are doing something with your day, including watching the show, for which I'm grateful for. Uh, as I said last week in my episode on Dan Campbell, which I really enjoyed kind of building upon with Dave Grubb on my Friday episode, I'm going to kind of spend this month barring anything that kind of pops up that I feel needs to take precedence, kind of exploring different coaching, coaching styles, traits that I think are important and situations that really show a a lot of what those characteristics are. So it started with Dan Campbell because he was always a very curious subject to me and that he kind of came out of nowhere in a way. I guess I should have kind of seen it coming more realizing, you know, that he did have interim coaching experience as uh, the Miami Dolphins head coach, but reading back on what he did in that very short period of time there, what stuck out to me was how much he simplified things, emphasized things like running the ball. And to the point where Bill Belichick was actually quoted saying that he was impressed by the turnaround in Miami and that what he was doing was really working for him. And then you hear players from that team say that they would run through a brick wall for Dan Campbell. And then you think about him being brought to tears by some of the losses last season. It just kind of seems like almost in that kind of lovable giant way that I I would think of like Rob Gronkowski for lack of a better example, but he really seems to have his finger on the pulse of connecting with the team. And it's hard for me to ignore the influence of what I guess I would say is his mentor and probably the first, uh, I think, branch of Sean Payton's coaching tree, which is where I'm going to kind of tailor this uh, conversation today. I think that I could do, and I probably will do, multiple episodes on different facets of Sean Payton's coaching because, again, it's from both a expertise perspective. I know, you know, that's a relative term, but it's a team that I've been following since I was in sixth grade, really. I brought this up, but, you know, I my family went through Hurricane Katrina. I came down here in December of 2005. I saw the destruction really close up and personal. I volunteered at a dog shelter. My mom just reminded me that uh, back in California, we had done a something at our middle school cultural fair where we cooked a bunch of jambalaya and gumbo and had all the proceeds go to Katrina. And so I, I followed Sean Payton and it's really, he is the reason that I fell in love with the game of football because that's what I grew up watching and being so intrigued by the turnaround that the Saints had and the balls that he had in the Super Bowl. And that's really where I'm getting at today. I think that ambush is somewhat underrated in the sense of all of the factors involved that I think if you're an analytics person, you might have been screaming from the top of your lungs, even though surprise onside kicks do have a pretty good success rate all of the factors involved in making that call, to me, it still remains a bold play in Super Bowl history. But as I was watching um, you know, a video that, recapping that season by the Saints, there were a lot of things that stuck out to me way more than that exact play. And it all comes back to that connectivity level and how good of a relationship coach Sean Payton really is. And when we talk about coaching trees, there, there are a couple that just stick out to me on the top of my head. Really, it's the three Bills, Bill Walsh, Bill Parcells, and Bill Belichick, uh, mainly as a foil to those two, because uh, just his coaching tree objectively has been not good outside of Brian Flores, and if I'm forgetting anyone else, but as I talked about with Dave on my episode Friday, I think a lot of people are trying to be Bill Belichick, and <laughs> no one's going to be Bill Belichick. I mean, this is a guy that when he was 11 years old, bartered his homework with his dad that if he finished it on time or early, he could watch film with him. At 11, I mean, you're just never, you're never going to make up for that, but it just speaks to the idea of being yourself. And I think that rings true in every industry and any facet of life, including, you know, all the roles that I do. If I came on here and was some hot take person or pretended to be some offensive guru when I just, I'm a defense person, I'm getting there. But again, it's just trying to be something that you're not. It never works out. I, I think that Anyone should go 110% and be themselves. And if you fail in that facet, trust me, I think it's a lot easier to reconcile with and sleep at night than if you feel like you weren't just being yourself. And I feel like 
Dan Campbell is nothing but himself. And so is Sean Payton. And I think that's really one of the primary influences that Sean Payton had on Dan Campbell. Because, you know, when I brought up those three coaching trees, Bill Parcells is that coaching tree for now Sean Payton and Dan Campbell. Uh, both of them considering Parcells to be a mentor, but Dan Campbell was also a player on the Giants when Sean Payton was an offensive coordinator and got his play calling duties revoked. And I saw quotes from Campbell as a player back in 2002 saying that he didn't necessarily agree with that call and that it, it wasn't Sean's fault. And then he, you know, hires him 17 years later. And I, I was, while I was reading about this, you know, Dan Campbell had said that it was actually pretty valuable for him to go from being an interim head coach in Miami to back to being a position coach with someone like Sean Payton. Because now he had such a keen understanding of the value and what is really important in that relationship between a position coach and a head coach and wanted to be able to assist Sean Payton in that matter. But that's always a two-way street. And again, what I take away from that is that Sean Payton was open to that and uh, willing to set people up in positions to succeed. And that's really what you're talking about, what makes a good head coach. But it's also his ability to handle chaos. Same goes for Dan Campbell. A lot of guys, A, wouldn't want that Detroit job. But they come in and you lose the first eight games of the season. And yet Dan Campbell still had these guys totally believing in themselves. That is ridiculously impressive to me. A uh, First year head coach at that team, 0-8. And yet I'm reading articles about how Dan, Dan Campbell is building a culture there. That, to me, again, goes back to Sean Payton, because when you talk about building a culture, and you know, I see a lot of this on the two-lane aspect. There are things that happen. We had Hurricane Ida uh, and just a, a lot of things in life, but Hurricane Katrina is just not a normal thing that teams go through. And when you talk about building a culture, we're talking about a guy that Turn down a job, a head coaching job in, La I said Las Vegas, it was then the then Oakland Raiders in 2004, and then probably took what I would think would be the least attractive job in the 21st century in New Orleans at that time with no quarterback, no city to be had. And yet it, it seems like Sean Payton genuinely likes and embraces these challenges. And I think you're seeing that now in that kind of getting a new challenge on a different team. But again, they're both under this Bill Parcells tree. And what sticks out the most in that tree of traits is how Sean Payton always talks about Bill Parcells really understanding the power of confrontation and how to create a crisis. When you talk about operating in chaos, uh, again, you're not always going to have a hurricane, but you think about, again, the 49ers in 2019 and week two, where half your team drops like flies. How do you respond? You still have 17, I guess it was 16 at the time, but you still have a whole season to go. How do you deal with that? Think of Sean Payton's last year on the Saints, four quarterbacks, no kicker. I mean, that really takes an ability to just be able to be a calm face in, in a storm. And it comes down to little things like putting mouse traps in the players' lockers and saying, don't eat the cheese. And I know it sounds kitschy, but it's the idea of not getting complacent in your success. It's the same thing, again, kind of like two lanes, one and no mentality of this is one game at a time. No one should ever get too ahead of themselves. When they played the Patriots in that 2009 season, he filmed a video that I would pay a lot of money to see where he dressed up as Bill Belichick and roasted the Saints coming from Belichick's perspective. You know, he dressed up as a bellhop in Miami when they were down there in the Super Bowl just to you know, see how players reacted and interacted and bringing things like the smoke machine and the lights to away games. I don't think people uh, always appreciate how much players uh, appreciate those kind of things. It Psychology is a really important part of the sport. And I, I think that if you're not thinking about the psychological game and, and for lack of a better term, warfare, that is football, then you're really missing a lot. Like you think about the bat game where I think that got a little conflated with Bounty Gate because it was the same year, even though I just, they have nothing to do with one another. But, you know, the 
Cardinals playoff game that Super Bowl year where they lost the final three games of the season after going 13 and 0. Like the last thing you want to do is go sliding down a momentum train like that. And you know, we, a lot of, uh, again, thinking about talking with Nick Anderson about the Kansas State game for Tulane last year and how like they all knew that that was going to be big boy football. And they proved it with four really strong fourth down stops. That's, you know, a physical game. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And you think about them all running out and Reggie Bush is just hoisting this bat above his head. But then you think about how they performed in that game and how physical they were on both sides of the ball and aggressive in all three phases of the game. That's what those little things do. That's what that little attention to detail really pays off. It's not just in the playbook. It's, again, it's so much psychology in the sport that I think is critically ignored and underdeveloped by a lot of coaches. But if you're going to talk about probably the biggest psychological test of a team of all time, uh, Katrina arguably is probably at the top of the list, but ambush. Gutsiest play in Super Bowl history. That's obvious. And, you know, I know we're all really aware of that play, but the amount of things that had to go right and the amount of trust in so many different levels from players to position coaches all of that to me again makes that call so much more than just wanting to emulate his uh mentor Bill Parcells in, in his fake punt in the 1990 NFC championship game. To me, that was where Sean Payton cemented his legacy. Let's talk about ambush. Uh, the definition of the word is a surprise attack by people lying in wait in a concealed position. And quite frankly, I don't think that there's a more apt term to describe really the New Orleans Saints as a whole, the entirety of that season, despite going 13 and three. They were really a team that no one saw coming and maybe they should have. Kind of reminds me of Tulane in a way, just in that I think that they were a better team than what they showed on the field. And that was kind of what it looked like in the 2008 season. Not to mention the fact that they were one game away from the Super Bowl in the first year coming back from Hurricane Katrina, first year with Drew Brees at the helm in 2006. But yeah, I remember, again, I was 15 at the time. And back then, you really didn't you didn't have streaming like we do today. And I know that there are a lot of valid qualms with that. But quite honestly, it was almost impossible unless you went to a sports bar to watch games of a team that you're not in the area for. And I wasn't watching 49ers games. So, you know, we're kind of trying to follow along. You notice the Saints are 3-0. and And, you know, my mom and uncle, both born and raised in the Irish Channel, you could already tell that they were just getting a little anxious. Like, what's kind of going on here? And so that was when I decided, all right, well, I should probably start paying attention now. And, again, I, I wrote an article on this when Sean Payton retired. And I'll, I'll get to that at the end of this. But, you know, I talk about kind of my experience leading up to the Super Bowl that I ultimately watched in New Orleans, but I will never, never forget the memory of Ambush. You know, I think we can all agree, uh, New Orleans Saints fans, that the first half of that game, everyone kind of had the feeling of, you know, we're just kind of happy to be here because it's Peyton Manning. And yeah, for a long time, Saints fans that are used to just being cynical about their team, it was kind of, okay, well, this is the same old song. We know how this goes, but just kind of resigning. And again, weird par parallels, but it was sort of how I felt. I think I was a little more optimistic because, again, I know the team a lot better. But, you know, when Tulane was playing Cale Williams and just could not get a stop on him, that's kind of what the feeling was with Peyton Manning. And attention to detail to me and aggressiveness, that and player connectivity are probably my core three of – coaching trades and attention to detail to me really pays off the most in special teams. There are teams that I, I believe USC didn't have a special teams coordinator. And then you think about the player fumbling at the one yard line and ultimately leading to that game, changing safety. That just goes to show you how much special teams matters. When you think about the one loss that Tulane had that season, it was a three point loss where they blocked a punt. They blocked a field goal and they missed a field goal. So that's six points easy. And that's just how football goes a lot of the time. But 
all three phases of the game really have to pay off. But how do you get an edge when you're going against uh, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time? I guess you could have said the same thing about facing Drew Brees, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of the time you have to make it to the big boy stage. MVP discussion, uh, criminally snuffed of aside, you know, winning Super Bowl MVP, I, I think, you know, put Drew Brees on the map as did that performance, but they all knew they were up against and they both had very, very strong defense. And so what's that edge come from? It, it comes from special teams. And there's aggressiveness to be had in a lot of different ways. Uh, going for it on fourth down, that. It's tied up in analytics, which I'm still kind of trying to figure out, to be honest with you. It has a lot more to do with film tendencies than I think just numbers in general. But there is kind of a system to the probability of certain things working out. And one yard can make a, a call go one way or the other. But we see, I think, analytics and the risk of them when things don't go well. Like You think of Brandon Staley and the Chargers and how he really has kind of leaned in that aggressiveness using analytics. And then you think of Mike Tomlin who just says like, I don't care about analytics. I have a gut feeling. I think we can get this fourth down. I tend to be more with Mike Tomlin on that one, but in that game too, uh, you know, the saints, I, I think went for it on fourth down, didn't get it. And I didn't have those three points on the board, but then they kind of got not so much a break, but that game kind of felt like it should have been more than 10 to six at halftime. But having that last second field goal, which not last second field goal, but to have a second one in that first half, not to mention Garrett Hartley, again, special team speaking, kicking two 40 plus yard field goals. He was a second player in Super Bowl history to do that successfully in one game. And the Colts took their foot off the gas pedal a little bit. You know, they had an opportunity to get into their two minute offense and they decided to run the ball on third down and, and didn't get it. And saying that they were going to go into their two minute offense afterwards, they're not always going to get that chance. And that's really, I think what was more on the saints mind, knowing that they were the underdogs. And when you're the underdogs, I think you're always kind of trying to look for getting that scrappy edge, but it, it, there's so much about that play that sticks out to me. It's the guts of, of making that call in to kick off the second half of the Super Bowl, because if that goes wrong, now you've given Peyton Manning really good field position, and you at that point are really playing to win stupid prizes with momentum. That to me also shows that they had trust in their defense that they wouldn't be able, you know, that they would be able to mentally handle this not going their way. But the meticulous attention to detail again comes into the fact that. They made sure that they were doing it the right direction to go with the wind, to make sure that it was on the side of the Saints and that it was congruent with what they had seen in the Colts formation that led them to make this play with the two guys on the left kind of bailing early to their blocks. That was what Greg McMahon and then noticed on film because originally Sean Payton wanted to run a fake punt. And when you talk about being yourself, this is probably the paramount example of him kind of trying to emulate his mentor. He had wanted to do a fake punt like Bill Parcells in the 1990 championship game when the Giants beat the 49ers with that. And McMahon and John Carney, the Saints kicking specialist and special teams coaches, who's now Tulane special teams coach, McMahon is, said, oh, we're really, there's too many variables involved and we're not getting a good look for that. What about a surprise onside kick? We did it in 2007. Sean Payton has a reputation and for being, you know, confident, erring a little bit on cockiness, but that's where, again, balls come from. But he also is not cocky to a fault because when you get into that territory, you always think that you're the smartest person in the room. What is apparent, again, in the way Dan Campbell describes him, but really through the creation of this play, is how much he trusts the opinions of those around him. You know, he immediately dropped the fake punt thing and said, uh, okay, yeah, let's you know, do a surprise onside kick. They knew that they had a good kicker in Thomas Morstead, but Thomas Morstead was a 23-year-old rookie who had never kicked an onside kick before. And reading about his background, he really kind of went through it growing up. I was curious, and I was correct in that he did play soccer growing up. Uh, Tulane's kickoff specialist Casey Glover uh I think kicked four onside kicks in the two and ten season 
he had the form down so to a T and it's his background in soccer that largely has to do with that. He actually stopped playing football because he got hurt, played soccer again, and then didn't make the team his senior year. And his mom encouraged him to try out again for the football team. Now, then he ends up at SMU and really just goes on to have a really strong career, but he had to take, you know, risks. And that's kind of, you know, I've talked about how I got demoted for lack of a better term, where my coach needed a leader on, on his new team that he was forming. And it was kind of an ego check for me. That's kind of the same way as, you know, getting cut from the sport that you truly love and then going back to another one and finding your way through that. But John Carney knew that Thomas Morse said could make this kick. And I think a lot of guys crumble in that situation. I think a lot of guys crumble when they're Garrett Hartley the week, or not the week, but the game prior where, you know, his kick send them to the Super Bowl and, and Sean just comes over to him and puts it really simple. You belong here. And now just hit the Florida effing Lee. You know, it does not need to be this really deep thing. And that's really how he treated Thomas Morstead. And you know, there's so many stories about this, but you know, the halftime of the Super Bowl is elongated. And you know, immediately walking in there, Sean decides we're going to run ambush. So he goes in first, asks the defense how they feel. That sticks out to me again a lot. Because again, he knew that that's putting that on them to give Peyton Manning potentially half the field, uh, a field position and getting their kind of approval. Let's do this kind of thing. Like they were all so hyped up for it. And then he just walks by uh, Thomas Moore said and says, we're running ambush and keeps walking. I think that a lot of people might see that as really cold. What I think it was, was not putting too much in Thomas Moore head that that was kind of an indirect showing of trust of we don't even need to have this conversation. We've practiced this and, and we're doing it. And then he walked away. And Thomas Morstead has said initially was kind of mad that Sean Payton told him it that early, but he's grateful for it in the end because it kind of gave him time to settle down. And again, I, I think the psychology of the game is so critically underrated and it comes down to things like timing like that, where, yeah, if he told them right before they were going out, I, don't think that goes the same way, but just how fired up all of them were about this. And just the last thing that it really showed to me is instilling confidence and trust in your players in so many ways on that play. But the fact that they spent halftime going over the first eight plays on offense, because in their minds, they were getting this onside kick and all of them walk out holding the, the biggest secret besides uh, Jim Nance, who apparently was aware of this, just not sure when it was going to happen, but everything has to go perfectly, but it was so well coached. You know, it wasn't just, oh, Chris Reed just popped out of nowhere. I, I don't think he was supposed to be the primary guy there, but he had been coached to kind of be that cleanup duty. And so he was right in the right position at the right time. All of them made their assignments. But then there's guys like Jonathan Cas Casillas who came out of nowhere and really wasn't supposed to be that involved in that play. And he just jumps in the scrum and starts pulling people you know, off one another. And just, again, going through all the facets of that, the guts to make that call. What happens if it doesn't pay off? That's something that he addressed with the team. What happens if it does pay off? It reminds me a lot of Willie Fritz in Kansas State. Not necessarily the same stakes, but... Same guts where Tulane was on something like their 24 yard line and there's two minutes left in the game. Defense has made stops all game long. Four fourth down stops held Kansas State to 10 points up to that point. And I had at that point gotten all the way up to the booth. And I remember just hearing Corey because I still had my microphone on. Uh, the, Corey wore the voice of the wave saying, wait a minute, uh, there's no way he's going for this. And I watched the TV broadcast of it. And I just was like laughing, watching it again, because again, it's kind of like ambush where you know what's coming. But you know, for Willie to have put Michael Pratt out there on fourth and one on Tulane's own 24 yard line to win the game, you know, there's, there's a difference between not losing and going to win a game. And sometimes it takes a call like that. And it took a call like ambush, because if you look at the psychological makeup of how that game unfolded, the pick six by by Peyton Manning, again, just incredible attention to detail by Tracy Porter, but 
when you harness momentum via special teams, just again, look at the safety in uh, Arlington. To me, ambush is just a microcosm of, I think really what makes Sean Payton great is everything that is illustrated through that call. Again, the aggressiveness, the guts to make it, the balls to even think to do that as a fourth year new head coach, first time in the Super Bowl, both for yourself and the franchise, and you're playing Peyton Manning, and in the weeks leading up, all he's thinking about is stealing possession from Peyton Manning because that's really what it comes down to. But that play does not work if those players do not all truly believe that there is no other possibility than for them to recover that onside kick. Onside kicks are a, a complete crapshoot, to be honest with you. I've seen, uh, again, an oppressing amount of them recovered, and you can practice as much as you want. At the end of the day, all it takes is a bad bounce. And luckily for the Saints, it, it took a good bounce, but... Yeah, again, when Chris Reese is at the bottom of that scrum, he didn't have both hands on the football. It was on, you know, he had it pinned by his leg. And again, you talk about Jonathan Casillas not supposed to be really involved in that play at, at, at all, comes in like a dump truck and just portals him, uh, several Colts players off him. But just again, then you think of the confidence in which the, the Saints played that second half of the Super Bowl. I said this when Tulane won the Cotton Bowl in the postgame show, when Alex Bauman got up, from that game-winning touchdown, the way that he would not relinquish that football and was so outwardly sure that he had made that catch. And again, this was someone that was not really involved in the offense. is a first-year guy, a freshman in Bauman, and he's this confident that he made it. And I remember in my head or my earpiece during the game saying, you know, uh, Corey, if Alex Bauman is this confident. I'm really inclined to believe that he'd made that catch. It reminded me a lot of Lance Moore's two point conversion in the Super Bowl, which was one of the coolest plays ever, and how confident he was to where they ended up throwing a challenge flag. But here's the thing again, that game was so, uh, they knew that there was no margin for error, hence the wanting to steal that one possession and you know they lose that challenge they lose the timeout Sean trusts his players and that's really what it comes down to and I was gonna really focus this episode more on special teams mainly because I've been meaning to kind of talk about the fact that Greg McMahon has joined Tulane's coaching staff as their special teams coordinator and you know again when you talk about people that love special teams Willie Fritz is at the top of that list that's one of the most important things that he emphasizes. I've had the benefit of sitting in on special teams meetings that he himself has conducted and just watching, again, the energy with which he approaches that. They have a, a point system uh, just to uh, you know, keep things competitive and keep players incentivized to really make plays on special teams. They also understand that that's what it takes a lot of the time to make a roster in the NFL. So it, it's such an important part of the game in so many facets, but Again, it all comes down to trusting your players and having that human connection in order to do so. And as much as the scheming and the strategy is all important, uh, to me, that call, again, just comes down to the business of human beings. Now, I, again, I've learned a lot, not just by watching Sean Payton, but it was, just to talk about the fact that he really is a good relationship person. Now, I have somewhat of a relationship with him. Uh, he retired on my birthday uh, from the Saints a couple years ago. And I just remember being like, okay, cool. That kind of sucked, but it kind of felt serendipitous to me because the Saints had got, made the Super Bowl in that NFC Championship game January 24, 2010, which was the day before my birthday. And I've always had this weird kinship there where you know, I saw along the way that Sean Payton was from San Mateo, and so am I. And it's really random now that, again, it's where Tom Brady is from, Barry Bonds. You don't know what's going on in the water in San Mateo, but, you know, his 
childhood home is exactly where I grew up. And so I really did feel a kinship, but I felt this kind of intangible loss in a way that I wasn't really expecting. And I know that you're not supposed to be you know, personally kind of invested in that way when you're, when you're covering teams. I say that as I freak out at Tulane, but that's a different story when you work kind of with the team. Um, but I struggled to remain objective because again, everything for me was so tied up in my memories of Hurricane Katrina and how I, I watched the city be rebuilt through him and Drew Brees' character and leadership. And I wrote at that point kind of this really personal diary style, if you will, article where you know I was listening to his retirement press conference. And I will say there's a part of me that was really grateful that I had the chance to do that on my birthday. But I remember that you know, for all of the accolades, all of the division titles, the championship appearances, that the heights that this franchise has you know, hadn't really reached to this degree, this first franchise Super Bowl win. All he talked about was thanking the people that drove into the city when all of the cars were leaving. It all comes back to Hurricane Katrina. And it's personal in New Orleans in a way that it just really, and, you know, in, in this, Thing that I watched, Reggie Bush said this, I, I completely agree where I hope this never happens again, because that means that a, a city has to go through this. But, you know, I, I I felt moved by it. And I didn't feel like an article, again, talking about his coaching prowess from an X's and O's standpoint, really uh, did his career any justice, at least from, again, what I took away from it. And then I just decided to DM it to him on Twitter. And I said, you know, Hi, Sean. Um, I've been covering the team for the last three seasons. I wrote this on your retirement. Uh, something to the effect of, I, you know, if if you end up reading this, I hope you enjoy it. And you know, he sent me back you know, a very personal message that that touched him. And you know, he personally invited me then to his retirement dinner here. And that, to me, I think deserves a lot of attention. That whole thing as a whole. I don't know how many times a head coach has uh, retired or left a team and taken the entire media group out to a, a very nice long dinner where, you know, we were there for hours, drinks were flowing, stories were being told. It was probably one of the coolest things that I ever did. And it was really a moment of like, what am I doing here kind of thing. But all of the other people there, you know, they're telling stories from 10 years ago. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, again, like, how am I at this table? And that to me, again, goes to the character of Sean Payton to read something, uh, appreciate it, and, you know, show me that it meant something by uh, allowing me to have that seat at the table. Yeah, that's something I'll always take with me. And there have been times where, again, I'm working on the Scouting Academy, and I've reached out to him to ask him a question or two about safeties. Is this something that I'm seeing that's an instinct? You know, what is really kind of the distinguishing factors that you look for in a defensive tackle versus a defensive end? And you know, he's answered all of my questions. I, I reached out about Greg McMahon and, it, you know, he said he's a, a great players coach, passionate guy. But again, there's zero incentive for you know him to be answering any of my questions. He is an NFL head coach and I, not in a bad way, but it's like, you know, I'm just a, a girl down in New Orleans covering a lot of football teams, but that to me has kind of just been something that I, I keep to myself because it's not like, Oh, it's so cool. I talked to Sean Payton, but it's something that I think, again, just speaks to the business of people and how much that really makes a difference. And it, it comes down to things like how you treat the media and how you treat the people around you in his retirement speech. He said, you know, I, I think about how I would want my parents to remember me today. When someone's talking like that in their retirement speech, to me, that just really was the greatest argument of X's and O's are not the end all be all at the end of the day in this beautiful game of football. I could do another episode on Dan Campbell. I could do five, but I, I could do 50 plus at this point on Sean Payton. And again, this is a twice a week show all year round. And I don't even think I scratched the surface on Sean Payton's prowess as a head coach, but I wanted to talk about special teams. Like I said, a lot of the time, the way this show has gone is I have an idea 
And then the execution of it ends up taking a completely different direction just based on, you know, life. And as again, I was researching Ambush, decided to watch this kind of video of that story of the same season. And it just stuck out to me that the whole conversation was about how much the players all fought for each other, how much they saw greatness in one another, and that it was this brotherhood, that it went past the game of football. And everyone in that room knew what they could do. And there's something on there where really early in the season, I don't remember what it was, but someone had said before the season started, we're going to the Super Bowl this year. And everyone was like, yeah, actually, I believe you. And and to me, I was like that. It, it weirdly paralleled the conference championship confidence that I saw in Tulane. But just as I'm watching this special, it's on ambush. And, and there's a segment dedicated to it. But the whole thing about that team was really how much it went beyond the lines of a football field and how much it truly was a brotherhood, love, and seeing greatness as the sum of parts rather than individual accolades. And that's the ultimate team character that you could ask for. And that's to me, what wins these Super Bowls more than offensive uh, gurus. And you could call Sean Payton one. Absolutely. You should call Sean Payton one, but to me, it's his per, per, uh, people skills, his mental toughness and guts that, Thus far, I have yet to see someone kind of outdo on that type of stage in that type of moment. So that's my segment on uh, Sean Payton for today. And like I said, it's probably one that I will continue to explore, but it's one that, again, is personal to me because of my relationship to this team, this city, and relationship with, with Sean Payton as a mentor and a friend at this point. And that, to me, again, is really what I wanted to highlight on today's episode. So I'm off to uh, go boating for the 4th of July. I hope that everyone, again, is enjoying their holiday. And if you're in New Orleans, please wear sunscreen and drink water as we are still living through this excessive heat warning. I will be back on Friday with a guest. And I appreciate you guys all for joining me on this ride. Uh, again, hitting the milestone of 3,000 downloads is just nuts for me to conceptualize. So y'all are the best, and I will see you on Friday.